Welcome to the Cannabis Success Show. If you're a cannabis company owner or operator who's ready to scale your business, grow your profits, and plant the seeds to take your business to new heights, this show is for you. We'll share expert insights, industry trends, and actionable strategies to help you blaze a trail of success in the cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Success Show. Today, we'll be talking with Marianne Kersetji. She is the CEO and co-founder of Alibi Cannabis. I'm particularly excited because we haven't had a uh, West Coast uh, participant in our in our podcast. So we'll be diving into the Oregon market and the West Coast in general. Uh, we've talked a lot about some of the emerging markets, but Marianne, it's going to be great to get your take on what's happened in the Oregon market over the last uh, 10 years in your in your journey for that. So um, thanks so much for for coming on the show. We're really happy to have you today. Yeah, and thanks, Guillermo. Really looking forward to the conversation. Yeah. And so before we jump jump into, you know, market, I always like to get your, you know, take on your journey into cannabis and how you got into the space. Can you maybe take us take us through that story? Yeah, it's, you know, that's a, the cool thing about cannabis that I found is everybody does have a story. And I think that's what makes it a personal experience. Um, my background is very traditional. I've worked at Intel. I've worked at Microsoft. My degree is in accounting. I have an MBA. So very traditional tech finance kind of roles. And about 10 years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. And a friend suggested that I try cannabis as part of my healing journey. And at the time I was like, oh, wow, this stuff is great. This really helps. Um, there's so many medical benefits and it helped me eliminate my need for so many pharmaceuticals and it's just a plant. And so I was at a stage in my career where I was looking for my new opportunity anyway. And so while I was in the middle of radiation therapy, we started looking for property. We found property, started construction and built the farm. Wow. And, and so as you were, in that first journey, so you were in Oregon, and at the time, uh, was there was already a uh, medical interrect program, so you had really no issues having access to the plant. Yeah, it was right at the very beginning. So um, I I really got an understanding of the need for having an actual real medical program, which sadly in Oregon has mostly been eliminated because the adult use market is is just so much easier, but. Um, there's a net, you know, an underground network of people who generously gave medicine and provided plant medicine to people who were in crisis. And so for that reason, you know, even though we are a, a business, we're here to make money, we're here to, to, to build something really awesome. Like that's, that's what first got me into this. And so I have a, a passion and a, um, just like, we need to, we need to keep the patients in mind and the people who have gone before and have had a different experiences. You know, the people that have paved this path so that we could be here today are, are so important to remember. Yeah. I think there's so much, um, uh, you know, everyone has their opinions of what has gone on in cannabis, you know, a lot of challenges with profitability over the years. But, you know, if, if you ask me, I mean, those who have, you know, went through this have seen like some of the most, the toughest challenges from a regulatory tax standpoint, uh, you know, price compression. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I think in some ways, like this is building some of the best uh, business leaders because of all the challenges that that um, that you've had to overcome. Um, well, the first one being, uh, you, you kind of just briefly mentioned it, but one of the biggest challenges is securing land and property when you're you're getting started and getting the capital in place to do that. What was that like uh, when you started finding and what year was that, by the way? when you first uh, secured your land and applied for your license for your cultivation? Yeah, that was 2016. That's when we got started. Um, we purchased the land in 2016. And you're right, finding um, places that you, number one, can fit within the regulations, that you have enough distance from schools and from daycares and all of those, you know, there's, there's pretty significant barriers on the real estate side. But we're fortunate in Oregon to have a lot of farmland and um, it took me almost six months from the time I found the property until the time I was able to close the deal. So just because you asked how that worked, it's it's a really funny story. The, the land that I found was part of a larger 
um, group of nursery land. So two elderly gentlemen had owned it together and they had both died. So it was in the process of in being pro in probate. And I only wanted one piece of the property. I didn't want the others. They were in different locations. And we got a deal. It was all signed, but we had to wait months. They were tracking down the last heir and nobody knew where he was, but we needed his signature on this paperwork. He ended up being found living off the grid on an island in Alaska. So <laughs> that's what took so long. Um, but it was worth the wait because we were able to get a land that was perfect for our, for our you know, for what we needed. We could afford it. Um, the other risk at the time was that the land that we purchased was within some city limits and the city had banned any cannabis businesses. But fortunately for me, the city was going through a bit of upheaval. It was, um, there were restraining orders between city councilors. Police were called to city council meetings. It was a giant mess. And so because of that, the city disincorporated it, disincorporated right at the time I needed it to. So um, that solved all of our, our local land use issues. And we were golden, good to go and great way to get started. Yeah. Did you know that going in? Because I, I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, like a state like California, uh, one of the um, the most mature markets, there's still so many county cities that um, that don't allow uh, cannabis retail sales or, or cultivation. And same in Oregon. Right. Did you anticipate that? Like there's a state program and it maybe just assumed that it would be um, not so much of a challenge to secure land or space. Well, I'm really big on doing my research and going in with as much information as you can. I find that the more information you are able to figure out ahead of time, it sets you up for success because you're able to anticipate what roadblocks there might be. And so, yeah, I, I knew exactly the challenges and I had heard rumors that the city was going to be disincorporating. So I thought the risk was worth it. Even if we wouldn't have been able to build the cannabis business, the land was still a good value. And mm -hmm. so um, we're like, you know what, let's just do it. Let's, I think it's going to work out. We have hope and we can make it happen. And even if it doesn't, we'll be fine. Yeah. So step one was the the land and it wasn't so much the capital that was the challenge sounded like it was finding the the air that was in uh, in Alaska. Um, it's right. The last holdout. It's just crazy what you come across in uh, real estate. Like we work with real estate clients as well, and um, and it, it is crazy the things that that can pop up when trying to acquire a property. Can you talk a little bit about your your business model? Um, you know, we talk with so many who are in cultivation, but also you know go into retail. Has your business model currently and always been uh, strictly within cultivation? Yes, it has. And I think that's part of the reason why we have been successful and we survived the ups and downs of the Oregon market. It's because we have found our core competency, created structure around it, created a business around it, and really leaned into that. It's easy to get distracted with all of these bright, shiny objects of, oh, I want to try this. Oh, I want to try that. Mm -hmm. Oh, what about this? And certainly, I want to have an open mind and I'm happy to try things, but we have to stay focused on what we're good at and what we know we can make money at and retail specifically. I it's been so tempting and so many people have told me, Oh, you should be fully integrated, but running retail is a whole separate business that I do not want to, I don't have the skill set for, and I just, I don't want to do it. And I feel like your capital gets spread too thin and your, work gets, you know, you're, you physically just get stretched too thin. And our, um, you know, our, the way that we've been successful is by staying lean. We don't have a lot of extra fat. There's, there's, you know, we all chip in and do the grunt work. We all, you know, if something needs to get done, you show up and you do it. And that's just the way we run our business. And I feel like staying focused and um, being lean are, are keys to that success. And for, for those who aren't as familiar, when you're a cultivator, uh, you're essentially competing in the, in the flower market. Your, your customer is a retailer. Uh, generally retailers are about 40 to 50% of sales are, are in the, in the flower category. And that's also, uh, the most challenging, right? Because they, they compete a lot on, on price and, and THC content, but before the, the show we were just chatting and, and you were going into some other product lines. Are you also 
competing in other, uh, you know, form factor categories other than flower or kind of how has that evolved? We, um, about 90% of our sales are straight flower and that's good for us because we figured out how to be competitive in the flower market. We focused on quality and, um, we are not the highest price out there, but we try to be the highest quality. So a good value, but yet everybody, everybody enjoys the experience. And because of the, the focus on flower, we also have joints, pre-rolls. So we take our bee buds and we make pre-roll, make them into pre-rolls. So they're still high quality pre-rolls. And we have done some collaborations on gummies and syrups, but to be honest, the market in Oregon is so competitive that it's if it's not your core focus, it's really hard to make money. Um, we found that all of this work building, you know, trying to come up with a really cool collaboration with awesome flavors, great effects. It's just there's no money. So why do you why do you do all this work and all this brand building and all the product development just to make five cents each at the end of the day? It just it doesn't it doesn't pencil out financially. Yeah, pre roll is one of the of the fastest. Uh growing categories and and so it makes a lot of sense and can you take us through you, you mentioned 2018 but th there has been some you know tremendous challenges in the west coast with flower pri wholesale pricing right just the just the supply and the demand what what was that what is that journey what were the things that you did to to kind of weather that storm you mentioned staying lean that's got to be a big part of it but i would imagine also being able to adjust your overhead, right? Adjust your costs as, as there's changes um, in the in the in pricing. Is, is that been part of it, or what? What did you see helped you the most in trying to to kind of weather that storm when wholesale prices started to to compress over the over the last few years? And yeah, since you started to give you yeah to give you an example on wholesale prices when we first started the business, um, of course having my financial background, I like modeling everything out. I'm like, yeah. okay, this is, you know, this is the best, you know, the most likely scenario and this is the best case and the worst case. So you at least have some sort of sense about where you're headed. And our most likely scenario at the time was $2,000 a pound. We, we modeled it higher. We mo modeled it less, but I was like, you know, based on what we're seeing in the market, this is, this is where we're at and made a lot of decisions based on that. Well, very quickly things, compressed, you know, more people got licensed. Um, the green rush was on people were like, Oh, we're going to invest in the cannabis business and we'll get rich. Well, you know, you couldn't be further from the truth, but, um, so things changed really quickly. So in the middle of like 2021, those, those times wholesale pricing for us dropped to, uh, we we're lucky if we could get a thousand dollars a pound. So that's half. So you imagine you look at, your forecasted budget for the year and what you have projected for income and you cut that in half. Mm -hmm. So we were fortunate because, you know, like we were talking, we're very lean, but also I'm, I'm the landlord. So if, so if we had to skip rent because we didn't have enough cash, then we could just skip rent. We weren't, I'm not going to evict myself. And so having control over the big expenditures um, really made a huge difference for us because in, in those lean times, you know, if I wasn't able to pay rent, that's fine. I, I got caught up later. Um, but it, it made a, made a huge difference on whether or not we were able to thrive and going through those lean times. What we learned is we really, for the flower market, we really had to focus on quality. We've had times in the past where due to various reasons, our quality was not where it should have been. And that's when prices drop and you can't get off of product. And so we get back to the basics, quality, quality, quality. And that's shown, you know, that that's holds, holds true today because we're able to, we'll, we harvest every month and we're able to sell out of every month before the next month is ready. And that's, that's where I want to be. We're not in the the cannabis storage business. I don't want to store it, you know, grow it and store it. We're in it to, to grow it and sell it. So staying focused on sales velocity has, has been important also. Yeah. And that's a great, uh, that's a great point. I love the the velocity that that point that you just made. And I love that you're uh, a fellow account. So we can talk about yield and metrics and, and yep. all these things, but not a lot of industries where you see a, a, a wholesale price is just cut in half in such a short 
period of time. Um, you mentioned control over your your expenditures. Um, so one of the, one of the things is over the last few years, you know, the flower category being price sensitive at the consumer level, at the retail level as well. And you focus on quality. Have you seen a shift uh, over the years? As and maybe it's more so in 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 California, Oregon, Washington State markets, where the consumers are are more educated. They're used to this higher quality. But even despite that, have you seen a shift towards consumers uh, become more educated about terpenes and uh, aroma and just the different? Uh, you know, qualities of flour to, to drive higher prices and to be able to sustain like a high quality uh, business such as such as yours. Um, have you seen that shift in the West Coast even more so than it already has been? Yeah, it's it's really interesting thinking about how regulations impact the customer experience, because what I I firmly believe in like as a as a user, as a as a consumer, how do how do consumers make their choices? And you know, there's there's lots of studies and people who are way smarter about this than I am. But you know, if you're going to go pick up a bottle of wine at the grocery store, you can't try it. So you look at the label and you look at various things. Um, so how how do people choose cannabis? And fortunately, in Oregon, most stop shops are deli style, so you can actually open up the jar and smell it and, and see if those aromas are there for you. And if it's something that smells good to you, you're like, Ooh, I want this one. Uh, sadly in most other States you can't. And so it's, it's a, it's, it's this whole interesting conundrum that's brought out by regulation. So in Oregon, because it is deli style, people can smell and choose. Um, I feel like it's, it's a, better option for people to actually get the quality that they want because what might work for you might not be what I want and that we're all different. And that's why, that's why there's so much variety in cannabis and, and that's, that's a good and right and just thing. So how do, how do people choose? Fortunately, they here, they're able to choose based on smell. And I love that. Sadly, there's still this focus on potency, which hopefully will go away eventually. But it is sadly, I think, here for a long term. Long time. Still a long term. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it, we were just in, um, in New Jersey. You were uh, also there, right? And yep. at uh, MJ Unpacked. And we went, a uh, few of us got together. We went to go visit a, a dispensary. And it's just not, uh, it's just not a great experience. You know, there's a, there's a line and you kind of have to get a ticket and there's not much interaction. And, just being a, a CFO, you know, being on the financial side of things, I'm just thinking of how many sales are lost just because of this experience. You know, there's so many uh, people that just tag along and want to go into the dispensary and more than likely they would have purchased something if they were approached or they, if they could have um, the experience that maybe didn't make them feel so intimidated walking into a store like that or something. Mm -hmm. And so that is a huge difference and a big advantage of, of a market like Oregon, um, that where you're able to, to walk in. Um, and it, going back to MJ impact, I think you, you know, your presentation was on, on metrics and yield. You mentioned you, you have a monthly, um, production cycle. Can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the time from, from seed to sale and how you're able to uh, produce on a monthly basis. And for those who aren't as familiar with what that cycle uh, typically looks like, and then we can yeah. get into yield and. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, what we've done is we've divided our building essentially in half. So we have two different cycles going at the same time. And uh, for the most part, our plants come from mother plants. So we take clones, we take cuttings off of our mother plants, and those are raised up and will eventually become the flower that, that's consumed. Um, so from the time that we take cuttings, they're uh, rooted cuttings for about two weeks, and then they go to what's called a vegetative cycle. So they're transplanted into larger pots, and we call it veg. So they're in vegetative cycle for about three weeks. After three weeks, they are uh, transferred to the flower cycle and they're in the flower cycle for two months. So plant will start it at maybe 18 inches when it goes into flower and they end up being three feet tall by the time they're done with flower. And that's when it 
the, the light cycle changes, the feeding cycle changes, everything is focused on getting these plants to produce um, flowers, which is, which is what the product is. And so they're in there for a month, for two months in the flower cycle. So now we're at two months, like three months, give or take. So three months there, and then we harvest it and we dry it and cure it and hand trim, which takes another month, um, including testing. So we're at four months from the time that we have taken cuttings until the time that it is ready to go to the stores. So it's, it's interesting trying to plan that and schedule it. We have our system set up so we know what the schedule is, but um, being able to react to market changes is, is really challenging because you need to have at least six months. So let's say somebody comes up and say, oh, this cultivar, this strain is the coolest thing ever. I really want it in the market. Like I would love to sell this. One of our sales guys will come up and say, hey, you guys really should have more of this. But even if we want it to, it's going to take six months from the concept of it until it hits the shelves. So it's it's kind of like driving an aircraft carrier. You know, you you might turn, but you're you're not turning quickly. This is not a this is not a fast turn. Yeah, and you you mentioned the term velocity earlier, and so for those who aren't familiar with that term, I mean, you're you're talking about the time that you're investing uh, your cash in in payroll, in supplies, and everything it takes to all the costs that it takes to make it through that growth cycle until the time that flower is finally sold can be somewhere from four to six months. Correct. So you have this, uh, cash tied up, um, uh, maybe four months, right. We within that cycle. And so there's a couple of things that stood out to me is that first there's the fact that it takes a lot to start this up in terms of, of cash, you know, capital, because you're, you said you're indoor, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's more, uh, with indoor, there's a lot more of a, of an investment and, and, um, upfront capital, but there's also this long cycle. Um, and so there's cash tied up, um, in the business to get to when you finally sell. And so that's the question we, you know, we get a lot, um, as a virtual CFO is, you know, I'm, I'm making profit, but at the end of the month, you, at the end of the year or the month, you may still have some of that cash tied up in the business. Um, can you talk about, you know, how you've dealt with raising the cash that you need to start to grow the business, right? Because you need the cash uh, to make it through this this cycle. Have you, um, has banking worked for you? Have you looked at uh, other outside lenders or what are kind of some of the things to think through for a grower that needs some upfront cash to get things moving? Yeah, the initial capital outlay was really stressful because we had to purchase the land which we couldn't get financing for the land because getting financing for ag land in Oregon was very difficult. So that was all cash. And then we had to construct a building and buy all of the equipment for the infrastructure. So, um, you know, like you said, there's no SBA loans, getting, getting loans for that type of expenditure. They're, they're very predatory. And um, as, as they, you know, interest rates are high because it's a risky proposition. So I, I get the, the high, the high interest rates, but we had to do all of that, all of those expenditures before we got our license. We had to have our building ready to go before they would come in and inspect and give us our license. So that was, that was a lot of at-risk capital. And we were fortunate enough to be in a position where we were able to fund it ourselves. But, um, you know, most people aren't, and we're, we just, we got lucky that way. But part of the reason that that worked for us is we started off small so we only built out approximately a quarter of the building at first because we were like, okay, this is, I want to prove out these numbers. I want to prove out our processes, prove out exactly how, how this is going to run. And that ended up being brilliant, but we, we didn't know it at the time, but we we were able to afford building four small rooms. And that's what we did. We ran those for a few months, saved up money from that, and then gradually built out the rest. So it was a long you know, involved process as the construction was going, you know, we do construction and take a few months off, do more construction, but, but that's how we were able to afford it and stay nimble. Yeah. So it sounds like you took the approach of going one step at a time until things were proven out to, to kind of manage the risk of, of going all out and, and putting all that, that capital in. So sounds like a great uh, success story and that that's worked for you. Now, 
during this time and still today and some of this year, right, you're dealing with a high level of uh, taxation. How do you feel about the reschedule? Is the 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 two eighty e going away? Is that what you're what you're most excited about, or what are your thoughts on the potential reschedule this year? Just kind of open open ended question here. Yeah, it's interesting. People are getting really worked up about Schedule 3. They're thinking that Big Pharma is going to come in and take over. Yeah. I don't see that at all. I don't see, um, you know, what we grow, it's an agricultural product. So this is not pharmaceutical grade pills that you're going to, you know, that are consistent that you're going to put in a bottle and somebody's going to sell at Walgreens. It's a very different model selling an, a pure plant agricultural product. So Big Pharma doesn't bother me at all. Um having 280E deductions is going to be nice, but as a cultivator, that is not the most important. That is not the biggest problem that we face because we're, we're at the right place. As, as you know, you know, from your clients, like in the supply chain, we are able to maximize our actual deductible expenses. There's some things we can't, you know, legal and tax and, you know, a handful of other things, but, but we're in the right place so that 280E is not that big of a deal for us. What I see it more as, as a baby step, an incomplete baby step that's going to get us towards full federal legalization. Um, so that's, that's still the eye on the prize. I don't think, I don't think stopping at schedule three is doing anybody any good. Yeah. And I'll just make a quick comment here for those who, um, may have not caught that is what you're saying is uh, on, on the tax side is that cultivators are able to deduct more costs under 280e as opposed to a retailer who essentially doesn't have much of cost of goods sold and so since taxes are essentially you know 280e basically taxes your gross uh you know gross margin versus your net income as a as a cultivator a lot of your cost goes into your product you have very little overhead such as legal and what you mentioned so the tax rate at the end of the day for a cultivator isn't as high as what it would be for a retailer and so that's a that's a great point is that from your standpoint you're gonna lower your tax rate right but it's not a huge huge impact as it is for processors manufacturers and uh and retailers so what do you see as the the biggest potential because you know being in oregon you have, uh, we talked earlier about balancing that supply and demand and the interstate piece of it, the, it, the, the market being limited to your state has some impact on that. And you have, you're, you're kind of surrounded by states that are, uh, that are mature and that have uh, rec programs. Do you see a potential uh, interstate commerce helping uh, wholesale pricing or how do you feel about being able to potentially cross state lines sometime in the future. Uh, I think that, that, yeah, I think that being, the interstate commerce really is, is the, is the th next big thing that's going to really revolutionize the market because for all those reasons, you just said the, the West coast, Oregon, California, um, you know, Colorado, but the, for the outdoor crops, Southern Oregon and Northern California really are prime, is the prime location to be able to grow cannabis in a natural sun grown environment. And um, not only that, but we have this huge long history of, of knowledge and uh, skill for growing quality cannabis here on the West coast and other States, like let's say Arizona, New Mexico, you, you have so many other issues, like you have water rights and you just can't, it's, it's a very different environment. It's not set up to grow as, as a growing agricultural state. And so if we were really to think about big picture where people are gonna put their capital expenditure, there's no reason for people to build indoor grow facilities in every single state. It doesn't make sense from a capital perspective and it doesn't make sense from a talent and cost perspective. So I would hope that eventually we'll get to the point where we can produce where the, the states that should be the producer states are the producer states and the states that, that don't, don't, you know, we sh shouldn't be building indoor growth facilities in Arizona where it's 150 degrees. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So what, what I hear you saying is that, 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 whereas, you know, many times I think it's easy to say like one rec market in one state is this, is the same, right. And once the new rec market opens up in the neighboring state, you know, um, 
there's less sales, you know, in your market, it's not that black and white. I think what I, what I hear you saying is that because of the high quality of flour in that region, even states, neighboring states like Washington, Nevada, um, you are going to gain some market share through, um, interstate commerce just because consumers in those markets, even though they have rec programs, they will demand a higher quality, uh, flour from, from this region. Is that, is that kind of what you're saying? That's a, exactly it. Um, and even states that are just coming online now, if you go to, um, I don't know, let's just say New York, for example, when I was there a few months ago, you look at the top shelf, high end New York stuff. It is, it is, it, in Oregon, it would be on the bottom shelf. It would be the cheapest stuff. And that's, I'm not trying to diss on any cultivator in New York. You know, everybody has, you know, this is not a put down to anybody. It's just that the West Coast is where it, where there's that culture and that history. And so there's, we get really spoiled because even stuff that's the cheapest shelf here in Oregon is better than stuff that's top shelf almost anywhere. And it's, it's just a different, it, you know, we're, we're different side of the country, different culture, different everything. And mm -hmm. so recognize it's, it's like, like what we've structured our business. We've picked one thing and we do it well. And we focus on that. I think same thing with, with, uh, cult of, you know, with the different States, you should find the regions where it works and where you can grow efficiently and effectively at the right price point. And then they should be the producer States. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the, that's, that's a good, that's a good point because, there's markets like uh, Maryland or, uh, yeah, I would say I would use Maryland as an example. We have limited cultivation licenses, right? And therefore limited strains, which even in even in the emerging markets, that is taking, uh, that's allowing the licit market to uh, to grow to some degree because uh, the, the regulated market can't meet the demand. But one of the advantages of additional licenses, even though it provides, it kind of makes that makes it more challenging from a supply standpoint is that a state in a market like that is able to produce higher quality strains, not just because of the region, but also just because there's more, more producers, right. And, and more strains available in the market and consumers have more to choose from. Um, how do you see interstate commerce really playing out? Do you, do you think that's something that would be an agreement between states under the current structure or do you see full descheduling kind of driving that conversation further in the future that's a great question um i don't have a crystal ball i know there are a number of people who are hoping that there's going to be some sort of interstate compact oregon's governor has signed that so if my understanding not being an attorney but is is that if we get enough governors to sign on that we could get um, interstate commerce. So like Washington, Oregon, California, that would be great. Um, but that doesn't, so I think it's, it's fairly symbolic because the California market is tough too. So, you know, it's not like opening up California is going to magically make things better for Oregon. I think it'll actually might make it slightly worse. Um, but, but I think it's, it's symbolic in that it's, it's, it's one little tiny step forward. And that's how we make progress with keeping the mind on full legalization. Yeah, I agree. One, well, I was going to say, I agree in the sense that there's so many things going on that I would categorize into, this is truly impactful, like the tax impact from the reschedule, maybe not as much for cultivation, but it's still a huge, uh, it's a, a cash improvement to the industry overall. But there's other things like I think even if safer banking were to pass, I don't see it as an immediate uh, impact. I think many can get um, we work with a lot of banks and in, in a lot of states and it's not getting banking is not that much of an issue anymore. But I, I think it's more long term in terms of banks entering the space, institutional investors and in investing or getting educated and coming into the space. But I see it as a as a more of a long-term thing. And maybe perhaps you're saying the same thing with interstate commerce is that it would be a start and you really don't see the impact of it until several years down the road. Right. Yeah. And on banking specifically, I, it's interesting to, to think about what the issues are. And um, for us, you know, of course, access to banks, 
we we have a bank account, we have a debit card, we we pay, you know, we're legitimate business. I have checks. We're we we have all of that stuff. We're not a a cash based business anymore. But one of the impacts of of it still being federally illegal are things like um, my employees who are gainfully employed. You know, we we pay, we, they have benefits, I pay their social security, their FICA, all of that. But generally speaking, you, you can't go out and finance, get financing for a house, say, based on cannabis income. So even though they get a W-2, it's just like any other regular job. If they wanted to go out and purchase a house, they can't. And it's, it's things like that that are that cumulatively all these little things add up and just make it more difficult than it has to be. And that's, that's really what federal legalization will do is it will recognize that yes, in fact, this is a legitimate industry and we're doing things right. It's, it's a real business. We should have access to the same types of structures that regular businesses do. That's, that's, those are the types of stories that I think they're not uh, shared as widely. And that's something that, Probably not a lot of folks know is that, um, you know, if you work for a cannabis company, something like that could could happen to you um, or, or uh, a bank account being shut down if you're not careful and you're using like a, a large bank, uh, even as an employee or a service provider, um, that can happen. And it's it's pretty it's a pretty tough situation. I mean, I can't imagine not being able to get a loan because of where you're employed and you're employed legally. Mm -hmm. um, so, so hopefully some of this stuff will will start to to flesh out. Um, so as we're kind of getting closer to the end, one of the areas that I like to cover because it is we're in a year where the uh, the farm bill is being uh, renewed. A lot of things are being talked about within the the various states in the in the hemp market and the hemp derived market. What is the the current situation in Oregon with regards to the hemp market, does it operate uh, in the gray area uh, kind of adjacent to the regulated market or what are the, some of the things that you see kind of changing in, in Oregon with regards to the hemp side of things? Oregon's rules are very strict and protectionist. I feel that this is one of the areas where Oregon is falling behind because our regulators have chosen to um, make illegal a lot of those uh, minor cannabinoids and really folk, you know, drive costs up. So sadly, Oregon, while a leader in cannabis quality, has fallen behind in kind of this the bigger picture of 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 hemp and how that can add to the market. But I, there's a lot of people who get really worked up about these various loopholes in the, the farm bill, you know, THCA, the intoxicating hemp derived cannabinoids and things like that. And I, I think instead of having disagreements, having vitriolic disagreements between cannabis and hemp, I think we need to work together and keep our eye on the prize. The prize is full federal legalization and I firmly believe that the reasons for legalization initially were things like reduced access to minors. So kids should not be having access to intoxicants, whether they're cannabis derived or hemp derived. And sadly, the hemp derived stuff is available in gas stations in so many states. So, you know, we failed on the, you know, don't get kids high. Um, we've the testing, you know, no acts, you know, we want to have clean products. So no pesticides or other nasty things in there. So the, the legal cannabis market has, has, is successful in that very rocky, but mostly successful. But the same thing holds true for, for on the hemp side is it's just not working. You have no idea when you get a hemp derived intoxicant, whether it's been tested or not. Um, and so there's a lot of, um, unethical producers out there doing stuff that sadly are taking down that whole market. And, um, you know, the other big thing for big benefit of legalization was reducing cash to illegal uh, criminals, you know, so to, to criminal efforts. And so same, you could, there's the intoxicating hemp market is, it's a, it's distracting all of us from the, the right work of federal legalization. And so we need to find a way to work together so that we keep those those tenants available for everybody and um, just move forward together. When you say uh, 
like Oregon has banned certain cannabinoids. Is that just THC cannabinoids like Delta eight and Delta nine rather than regulating, uh, uh, the hemp derived products? Um, is that, is that what it is, is, is more of a, a ban rather than actually regulating the products? Correct. Yeah. Okay. You can't go into any store in Oregon and buy any hemp derived D8, D9 product. Um, so they've spent a lot of work banning it. But then the flip side is I could buy it from a company in Kentucky today and have it shipped to my house through the post office and it would get here regardless of whether it's legal or not. So it's it's a patchwork of rules that don't make any sense. Yeah. Same same in Texas. Like I follow the rules. There's a smokable hemp ban, yet you can pretty much buy anywhere. It's just uh, it's it's pretty gray, not enforceable. And um, there's talks right now in Texas of banning Delta eight and Delta nine. Um, I don't know if it'll, it'll happen. It's just so interesting to follow. Like right now in in Florida, the governor um, has uh, he I guess he has struck down the ban on intoxicating products in hopes of helping uh, kind of strike down the the uh the new uh rec program right or, or yeah. the votes on the program so it's just like uh there's different reasons for doing that i don't know if that's a good one but uh that's just it's just interesting how different states are are treating hemp and and trying to maybe like like maybe in texas like i know our very conservative uh you know policymakers don't want a rec program don't want to expend the medical program so they've kind of just left the hemp space alone because it there's a lot of jobs that the the secretary of agriculture is very supportive of it probably more on the on the seed and grain part of it but regardless it's 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 a lot of jobs and politically uh makes a lot of sense to help those industries grow but as you said uh there's story after story of uh, children getting a hold of these products um not just because they're getting high but because they're having very adverse effects because there's not uh proper uh, dosing or they're able to buy it and they're underage. And so, yeah, a lot going on and uh, a lot to do to, like you said, help those two industries, or if you want to think of them as two industries from a regulatory standpoint, um, really work together, right? Because a, a lot of good coming out of the hemp space. Um, so Marianne, lastly, we, as we're, as we're getting towards the end, I, I just like to I like to ask you've shared a lot with our listeners i think uh, i love your story about you know how you've navigated some of the challenges with with pricing and um some of your insights there uh you know by you, you know going through things one step at a time i think i think sharing your story is something that our listeners are really going to benefit from and i'd like to just wrap up with you know we touched on the reschedule but there's also a lot of, like you said, there's a lot that are worried about big pharma and stuff. But I, I, you know, from my standpoint, I have a lot of optimism about what the reschedule is going to do and shift things in the in the right uh, in the right direction. Maybe indirectly, one of the things that I like to point out is that companies are going to have more cash and are going to be, even though we're not going to have uh, safer banking, better credit, right? So there'll be better credit. Um, of cannabis companies just because taxes are lower and you're able to generate more cash. And so that will naturally increase access to capital and scaling, which just makes businesses more, more efficient. So I just see this year as just great progress. Uh, but I was curious to take, get your take as we're wrapping up is we can maybe wrap up with what do you see? What are you most excited about in the coming years? Yeah. Just to briefly go back to the credit piece. Um, a couple months ago, there was a study released that there's $3.8 billion of uncollectible receivables in the cannabis industry. And that's, that's a huge thing. You know, it's, we've kind of, we talked about cash and banking and all of that, but, but unpaid debts is actually massive. And so I am hopeful that the, you know, rescheduling from schedule one to schedule three frees up some of the cash so retailers can actually pay their bills because that's, that's kind of the elephant in the room is that, you might look profitable on paper, but cash flow wise, there are so many businesses who are really struggling. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that that schedule three opens that up for them. But 
Overall, we have to remember we're at the very beginning of this industry. Nobody has ever done what we are doing. And of course, there's going to mis be mistakes. And of course, there's going to be le learning opportunities. But the name of the game is pivot. And you, you try things and you've got to be willing to be flexible and to understand the market and being able to pivot when things change. And um, we are just at the beginning. And I'm really excited because I do think that that the hemp and cannabis markets need to figure out how to work together and um, keep the customer in mind because the cus there's there's a need for plant medicine in our society today. And that's why we grow. We grow with the highest quality that we possibly can because I don't want to put something in my body that is less than, you know, less than, and I don't want to sell it. So that's, there's so many great cultivators and great companies doing amazing things. And there's so much opportunity. There's room for all of us. We don't have to be fighting each other. We could can find ways to work together so that we, you know, I think, of, you know, it sounds a little trite, but I think we can heal the nation with cannabis. And so let's find a way to work together and make that happen. No, I completely agree. And thank you for bringing that up because I, I hadn't, uh, I hadn't brought that up, but that is one of the points of, um, all these talks on the 280E, whether we're talking about additional cash from amended returns or just the future impact is paying down debt, you know, mm -hmm. and that is one way for the industry to work together and to stay healthy is to pay down this big $3.8 billion of debt that we're seeing between uh, retailers and uh, cultivators and, and manufacturers. And so, yeah, this is, this is just the beginning. You're in a, in a mature market, but bigger picture it is it is fairly new right and so as you mentioned you know being customer focused and tapping into these uh new customer segments customers consumers are just becoming more and more educated and demanding you know higher quality i'm you know i'm one of those i i want to know where something's made the values of the product and those who are making the product and uh that is a a winning strategy just be consumer and customer focused as we kind of move into these next couple of years um, Marianne, where can people find you if uh, someone is trying to get in touch with you, whether it's a, a retailer or someone who wants to collaborate with you? Uh, what's the best place to find you? Yeah, our website is alibicannabis.com and we're on Instagram, Alibi Cannabis, and I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. It's pretty easy to find Alibi Cannabis there. So just um, go look for Alibi and happy to connect and I love sharing our story and keeping the eye on the prize, which is access for everyone. Absolutely. What a great way to end. That's all we have for today on the uh, Cannabis Success Show. Rand, just want to thank you again for joining us today, and we'll see you next time. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Enjoy this podcast? Visit our website, anderscpa.com slash virtual dash CFO dash cannabis to get more tips and strategy for achieving business success in the cannabis industry.